Welcome to the second in the Thames Luminaries virtual lecture series. A great collaboration to celebrate our local history and our local luminaries. My name is Rachel Morrison and I'm from Marble Hill and I'll be the host for these lectures. So without further ado, I'll hand you over to our wonderful chair of the Thames Luminaries lecture series, Professor Judith Hawley. Welcome to you all and thank you Rachel for your introduction and thank you for hosting this series. I want to thank also uh, Robert Youngs for doing all the ticketing, Angela and various other people behind the scenes. This is um, a, the focus today is going to be on our, our speaker, uh, Catherine, but um, this is a, a collaborative effort. We ran a series of Twickenham luminaries last year, and it proved so successful that uh, we banded together with a group now of nine different heritage organisations in the West London region to bring you this series of talks. Uh, we're all desperate to connect with our audiences. We miss you greatly. And from the numbers of people who've turned up tonight, it does look as if you're rather keen to hear, hear something about the, the culture of our beautiful area of West London. There's so many interesting people and places and stories to tell in this region. We're focusing in this series, particularly on our outdoor spaces. And I think now in our, our lockdown, those of us who have access to an outdoor space are, are particularly keen uh, to experience them. So we're going to be hearing about the, the history and the associations of our gardens of West London. So let me introduce our speaker for tonight, Catherine Parry Wingfield. I'm delighted to have her here. It's, it's, uh, she's a, a, a very well-known and, and highly regarded speaker and an expert on Turner, among other things. She told me a lovely anecdote about how her working relationship with Turner's Lodge began in her local post office in 2004. By chance, she met in the queue Professor um, Harold Livermore, uh, the last private owner of Sandicombe Lodge, J.M.W. Turner's countryside re re um, retreat. Professor Livermore told Catherine that he wanted to give Sandicombe Lodge to the nation, but the nation doesn't seem to want it. As an art historian, Catherine couldn't resist the challenge that this presented. How on earth could it be that the nation didn't want a house, not just lived in by Turner, one of our greatest painters, but where he also indulged his wish to be his own architect? Many years on, JMW Turner's Pretty Lodge has been beautifully conserved and will reopen to the public when circumstances permit. I hand you over now to Catherine Parry Wingfield. Thank you, Judith, and, and good evening, everybody. I'm using this drawing of about 1813 by William Havel, showing Sandicombe Lodge and its garden, using this as an opener, as it's one of the few bits of information that we have about the house and indeed about the garden. For those who don't know about JMW Turner's little house in what's now St. Margaret's to the east of Twickenham, Turner became his own architect here and used his lodge to bring him close to the Thames, not quite as close as it looks in this drawing, in fact, uh, as we'll discover, uh, and the Thames, which is going to inspire some beautiful paintings, but also very useful for Turner, it's going to be a good place to fish. It was going to be a retreat too from the pressures of the London art world. This was a smallish private garden and most of Turner's land has now been built on. But even though it's modest, I don't think this detracts from its interest. And that of course is enhanced by its intimate connection with one of our greatest painters. So keeping this image on the screen, uh, in 1807, when Turner was uh, about 30 something in his early thirties, the Zion Manor court books record his acquisition of a parcel of copyhold land situate lying and being in a close in the parish of Twickenham aforesaid called Sandpit Close. The area of the plot is given one acre, three rods and 16 perches. That's 1.7 acres. And for those who are not good with numbers like me, it's about the size of a football pitch. It would be some years before the house was built. He named it Solus Lodge for the first year after it was built, but then renamed it Sandy Coombe. So we've got plenty of clues about the nature of the land 
Sandy Coombe Lodge, Sand Pit Close on Sandy Lane. And the Coombe that he incorporated into the name uh, of the house, it's the, this steep slope here uh, as the land starts to run away down towards the river. It's a while before he makes his first sketch. And here, and this is not as he would actually build the house. You can see it has some columns at the back. He's gonna make, he thinks he'll make use of the slope of the land. But it does show us this little drawing really with a painter's eye. You wouldn't necessarily know it was his first thoughts for a house for himself. It could just be uh, a building in a landscape. But what it gives us in terms of the surroundings, you can see that it's standing alone. There's a tree fringed lane here. It's probably a uh, uh, hawthorn along the edges. That's what the lanes mostly were lined with at that point. There are some mature trees around the edge and you certainly do get that idea of the slope. He built the house perched up very close to the lane, even though he'd got quite a big plot to build on because that perch would have given him from upstairs a distant view of the river. And I wanted just to show you to, again, to get some idea of the surroundings, this engraving after a, a watercolor by Joseph Farrington, Turner's house would have been tucked away in the trees there. This is Cambridge Park. If he was going to walk up to the top of Richmond Hill, sketchbook in hand, which is what he would do, he would be coming along the road here, the, the road leading to Richmond Bridge, cross, cross the bridge, and up through the outskirts of the town, up the hill, past this handsome house, which must, I think, have lent him a little bit of inspiration for his own designs. And then probably at that point, moving on to the Star and Garter, that very well-known pub in its old manifestation, not the building that we know today. But it is again another handsome house with a very prominent view from a high point. Let's look at the layout of the garden. By 1813, Turner's name is in the rate books. So we know that although he'd taken his time somewhat, the house he designed was now up, having changed ideas about how it would look in quite considerable manners. The Enclosures Awards of 1818 show us the large plot here on which you see the footprint of his house and his smaller plot, his meadow. This is so-called Ferry Lane, actually the ferry now uh, really supplanted by Richmond Bridge at this date. And again, you see how it's standing, the house is standing alone. And the most prominent thing really within the garden is the very large pond. The Reverend Henry Trimmer was a great friend of Turner's and he visited often, bringing with him his young son, who decades later would recall at the end of his garden was a square pond, a rather think he dug it out himself, into which he put the fish he caught. The surface was covered with water lilies. So it's practical. The pond acted as a kind of early 19th century fridge because Turner would have caught probably rather more fish than he could possibly eat at one dinner. And it's also an account that he was greatly annoyed when the local urchins climbed into the garden and slipped a pike into that pond. The pike promptly devoured everything it could lay its teeth on. But it's also ornamental. Those water lilies um, would have been very pretty. And so a, a deliberate attempt, I think, to, to mold the garden. Turner's first biographer, Walter Thornbury, stated that the garden became a rude tangle where he grew the water plants he loved to introduce into his foregrounds. Well, Thornbury didn't know Turner or this garden. And it might indeed, perhaps in the later years that Turner was here, it might have become a rude tangle. But I do believe that when uh, Turner first planned it, he had some definite ideas as to how it would look. So again, you can see there are no near neighbors. And I just want to indicate the size of the garden now, which I'm sorry to say is only about that big. All the rest has been built over as over the years, uh, the suburb of St. Margaret's grew up. 
So one other little um, indication, and that is from Turner's sketchbook of 1812, a bird's eye view of the plot. And we get, um, we get some idea of the, again, the footprint of the house. Maybe he drew this as the house was going up. Footprint for the house, that pond where he's written pond enlarged. Some fairly close planting here, maybe some of those willows he's going to uh, uh, bring here as we'll see in a moment. Some paths, there's one here, which is leading to a gate on the corner of the plot. And this is the road that will lead to the bridge. Uh, and other paths curving their way around and down that rather steep slope and ending in this rather tantalizing spiral. Um, the other thing, yes, the spiral. Now, what could that have been? You're not just going to make a, a path that ends nowhere uh, in a little curve. It's been suggested by Chris Sumner that this might have been a mound, one of these rather decorative features of a garden. Uh, and perched up on that mound, Turner and his visitors might indeed have been able to get uh, a view of the river. And then this zigzag line all around the edge of the plot we read that as being a shorthand for a picket fence and up here, the lane. So an interesting little bit of information from which we can gain a certain amount, but not indeed a huge amount. Let's just consider this element for a moment with this beautiful little watercolor uh, of the 1820s, the years that Turner is coming and going to Sandy Coombe Lodge. He's up on the top of Richmond Hill, everyone out for a, a stroll on a summer's day. And this is the interesting bit, which I've shown as a detail here. One of those mounds, I'm afraid it's now vanished. You can't actually find it up on Richmond Hill anymore, but you can see a group of people up at the top. This chap has got a telescope. And Turner's little joke is that it's actually trained on the far side of the river and probably where among the trees Turner's house is now uh, giving him a great deal of pleasure. So coming back to Havel's uh, drawing and thinking about planting, what was Turner going to plant in this garden? We can get a certain amount of information. Certainly there are, appear to be hollyhocks, poppies maybe, um, some roses over here where there is a, a gardener with a wheelbarrow and a spade. And that's really quite helpful because this sounds like almost cottage garden planting up close to the house. And we can see some mature trees as well. If there were poppies, there might also have been chamomile uh, maybe on the lawn here. We know that his father, a barber in retirement here at Sandy Coombe, made a poultice from uh, poppy and chamomile when Turner strained an Achilles tendon. That's a very painful injury. And this was, was very helpful to him. And he sent the recipe to a friend in a letter. So, Maybe those things had a medicinal purpose, but otherwise it appears to be just planted out for a very pleasant view. I think we can make out the picket fence here and also this very wide path, this path curving down towards that large pond. If we move on 200 years, to 2019, when it came to planning what we would do to the garden after the house had been wonderfully conserved by the, the conservation architect, Gary Butler and his team, uh, we took on board the services of Ellen Bramhill, who is a historic garden uh, landscape expert. She's also worked at Pitshanger, which was extremely useful to us because Pitshanger was the Ealing mansion then pretty well in the country of John Soane, Turner's great friend, whose influence is all over Sandy Coombe Lodge. 
it was very useful that at, at Pitt's Hanger, Ellen had access to Mrs. Soane's plant list. Sometimes the women of the family are very useful with their diaries, their, their shopkeeping, their laundry lists and so on, for those of us who really like a paper trail. So one of the things that we did was to recontour uh, the lawn to get that that perch that in the drawing you see a man and a woman happily sitting on the grass. And in the summer of 2019, some of our uh, valiant gardeners learnt how to scythe. Fortunately, no dangerous injuries. Uh, an interesting and I think a uh, very wearying day, backbreaking day was spent, but a lovely pile of hay at the end of it. I'm sure that some of you will remember the Beast from the East of 2018, that horrible, horrible late winter freeze. It was quite amazing that only a matter of weeks later, these wonderful tulips started to show their noses almost as soon as the frosts had gone. And these are all varieties selected by Ellen Bramhill that would have been known uh, in the early 19th century. So our little garden, the little remaining part that we have, uh, has been made to work very hard. It is absolutely full of plants and really quite beautiful to see. We had other ways of trying to recreate that garden. This is the window here, which, um, which in the little parlor, we had this digital print made modeled uh, by some wonderful experts who can do all sorts of very, very clever things so that instead of seeing the side wall of the house now built very close up to it, we recreated the view that we think Turner would have had from that window. So you can see one of those paths, you can see a well in the corner, which we know he must have had. He must have had a source of water for his pond the edge of Cambridge Park uh, here, and then looking down in the distance, the view is blocked by Marble Hill down on the river. Well, it's not possible to think about planting without coming to the subject of willows. And I mentioned those when we looked at that, that bird's eye view. And the subject of willows links us really quite closely to Turner's long dead hero, Alexander Pope, whom we're going to hear about that garden very shortly. We can't be quite sure where Turner put his own willows, but we know that he was well aware of Pope's villa, and this would have been the villa as Turner knew it. And you can see that willows are certainly a very prominent part there in that garden along the water's edge. But when Turner was thinking about what he was going to build at Sandycombe and what he was going to put in the garden, a very terrible thing happened. The owner of the time, Baroness Howe, was going to pull the villa down. This upset Turner greatly. It made him extremely angry. He wasn't the only one. And perhaps that will be covered in other talks, so I won't go into it too closely. You can see that the house, Pope's villa, and all its memories of the poet has no roof, they're scaffolding, and it is, I'm afraid, doomed. In the foreground here, you can see the remains of a fallen willow. Turner had uh, perhaps a talent that you may not be familiar with, he not only wanted to be an architect, he also wanted to be a poet. And he vented his feelings about the loss of that willow uh, in a very long poem, writing, I'm not going to read you at all, but of the willow he wrote, now to destruction doomed thy peaceful grot, Pope's willow bending to the earth forgot, save one weak Zion by my fostering care nursed into life. So he took home a little, a little cutting from that fallen willow. It had come down in a storm and he planted it in his plot at Sandycombe, where it certainly seemed to thrive. 
So the Reverend Trimmer's son remembered from his childhood the long strip of land planted so thickly with willows that his father, who delighted in the garden, complained that it was a mere osier bed. And that's a bit rude because the osiers were the commercial willows from which you made baskets and things like this eel trap in the foreground, whereas Pope's willows were, I think, called Salix Babylonica, uh, a wonderful cultivated weeping willow. In Thames Scenery, which is a wonderful travelogue for which um, our, our own drawing of Sandy Coombe was preparatory. There is an engraving of Baroness Howe's new villa you see set back from the river. And there is a verse here which accompanies it. And you can see, you can almost feel the wagging fi uh, fingers. Oh, may no gaudy flowerets creep along the consecrated ground. Thou, this is the willow, are the muses' favorite tree. They loved the bard who planted thee. So, in trying to piece together how Turner's garden might have looked, we used, again, a digital uh, methods and cleverly planted within a telescope in the bedroom, Turner's bedroom, at the top of Sandy Coombe Lodge. Uh, if you look through that telescope, you will see the recreated view that we believe Turner might have had, looking towards the river here and up to Richmond Hill with the Star and Garter on the extreme corner. Again, that pub, I'm sure it featured in Turner's life. But here is his garden. Here you can see the paths, those curving paths making their way through the, the wedge-shaped plot. Here is his large pond, and here, of course, are the willows. Well, gardeners are really no good, are they, without a gardener? Here's a detail from, uh, from that drawing, from William Havel's drawing, uh, showing uh, this, this, this man, who might well have been Turner's father, Young Trimmer mentioned Turner's father and his complaints that the garden had been overtaken by Turner's willows. In real life, Turner's father was a barber in Covent Garden, but he was born in Devon and he really seemed to delight. I, I was going to say going back to his roots, but maybe that's a bad pun, but he certainly enjoyed very much in taking charge of that large garden at Sandy Coombe. His son referred to this activity as farming. So I think it was a little bit more than our suburban plots. And certainly, you know, one and three quarters of an acre is, is a biggish garden by our reckoning today. When we made a little film for Turner's house, we chose for our actor, we went to the National Theatre's uh, costume store and selected clothes for him that looked like the figure here in that, that drawing. So we gave him, you know, quite a coarse shirt, some plain breeches. We had no idea how big our gardener's feet were going to be. The shoes, the boots we chose, uh, in fact, were a little bit big, but he didn't have to do very much apart from jumping up and down from his chair uh, and um, and generally miming to, uh, to a soundtrack. It might have been the health of his father that influenced Turner's decision to sell Sandy Coombe. In 1826, the old man, now in his 70s, insisted on carrying out his gardening duties. Turner wrote to young Trimmer's father, poor daddy seems as much plagued with weeds as I am with disappointments. And then he goes on to say that his father is always catching cold and requiring looking after. So much against old William's wishes, the house was sold. The old gardener was taken back up to London where there was a little yard in Turner's Marylebone house, but no garden at all to speak of. So uh, I want to come to 
sounds and birds. In that drawing, it looks wonderfully peaceful. Two figures chatting, the gardener digging. There would have been the rumbling of wheels, the clatter of horses' hooves along that road to Richmond Bridge. There's plenty of bird song, and Thornbury, that biographer, said that it was here that Turner used to protect from birds nesting boys. So those urchins again, they're obviously a bit of a plague. So he would protect the blackbirds who sang and cheered him after his day's work, for which act of ornithological kindness they christened him Blackbirdie. Poor old Turner being teased by the local children. But in that drawing, there's a pair of peacocks. Were there really peacocks in Turner's garden? I've put up here with that, that little detail, a portrait of Walter Fawkes. Now, Walter Fawkes was a great friend of Turner and I just want to float an idea here, not just a friend, but an early patron, uh, a Yorkshire landowner, where Turner very often went to stay, to paint, and to, to have a good time, he'd go shooting with Walter Fawkes. He would paint the game birds, dead and alive, and the wild birds, mostly alive. Fawkes estate had a flower garden, it had a pleasure garden, and it overlooked a sweeping view with a lake. Maybe in the back of Turner's mind, he was trying to create a miniature Farnley at Sandy Coombe. It's possible that Walter Fawkes had peacocks. They were a fashionable uh, feature of, of landowners' estates. And it's when he was at Farnley that he painted this wonderful watercolor of a peacock's head, that alert gaze. It may be just included as a playful reference some scholars have suggested that it's symbolic of Turner himself with his acutely observant gaze. The peacock's habit of cocking its head on one side, uh, maybe staring closely and then pouncing on a prey. But we do know that Turner did not share the peacock's trait of gaudy apparel, nor was he known for loud squawking. The foxes had a London house and exhibited many of their Turner watercolours there in 1819 and 1820, including this one. Tantalisingly for me, in April 1820, Mrs. Fawkes wrote in her diary, drove out with Walter to Whitley and Turner's garden. Well, wonderful brevity, but surely she could have said a little bit more. She could have given us a little hint about the planting or whatever. However, I'm afraid she didn't. So we must leave the peacock there still to be discussed and considered. But I mentioned that this drawing was preparatory to an engraving for Thames scenery, one of those wonderful travelogues in word and image that was so popular. This is the engraving resulting from it. And you'll see the peacocks have been eliminated and have been replaced by a few more hollyhocks and poppies. Perhaps, as an afterthought, they seemed a little bit too pretentious. I'm going to finish with the idea of picnics, because I'm quite sure that that garden at Sandy Coombe was on occasion a very lively place, the chatter of friends, on one occasion, a group rode across from Ham, made their way up to Sandy Coombe and picnicked handsomely in the garden, providing their own entertainment with music and singing. On another occasion, the Picnic Academical Club, a wonderful name for Turner's uh, fellow artists from the Royal Academy, they came out to Sandy Coombe for similar lively entertainment. This little watercolour dates from 1831, a short while after he had sold Sandy Coombe. But it's placed on the river bank, on the Twickenham bank. You can see the bridge and Richmond Hill behind it. Almost it would have been in earshot of Turner's little house. I think in this painting, Turner is recalling some of those very pleasant picnics in the garden. 
as one visitor remembered, one of the most delightful days I ever spent in Turner's garden. So just to conclude, all the things we're missing, sunshine, sun and water, flowers, birdsong, friends, music, food. Uh, I will leave you with this detail of, of the picnic. And please note that in the background, there are some bottles, this one being uncorked, that's probably a dead one, certainly a couple more. And that seems to be a good place to leave Turner's garden. And when you can, do please, come and see it. You, if you're nearby, you can at least look over the fence and see what is still, even in midwinter, a very pretty little plot. So thank you all very much for, for watching in. And uh, I'm going to move to our last slide. And pointing out, please, thank you so much for your, so many of you have already contributed uh, financially, but um, we are all in, quite uh, difficult times and we'd be very grateful if you would visit turnershouse.org if you can to donate.